taking forever to start recording. There you go. All right, so photosynthesis. Um, this week we're supposed to do photosynthesis and plants. Probably just going to do photosynthesis today. We're kind of screwed up this week, and we're good as far as like um, scheduling. So um, I could probably just get away with doing the photosynthesis today. So here we go. Um, good thing you guys aren't here. It's free. We got freezing in this room. Really want to get a jacket. Um, so, cellular respiration was about breaking things down and creating ATP. Photosynthesis is about, it's all about anabolic reactions. You know, uh, respiration, cellular respiration was all about catabolic reactions, breaking stuff down. Well, I mean, I guess it was both because you're making ATP, that's anabolic. Here, it's just about Really, it's about making, you're making sugar. The plant, the leaves of the plant, they're solar panels, and they trap, they trap energy, and they take that energy and they make sugar with it. So that's what I'm putting, creating energy storage. And I put glucose, or I put this other molecule called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is G3P. G3P is, um, is a molecule that you can make lots of things with it. You can build starch out of it, you can make glucose out of it, you can make cellulose out of it. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, like I envision G3P as being half of a, of a glucose. Just like pyruvate was, right, for us at the end of, if you remember the end of glycolysis, we ended up with pyruvate. If you look in the book, right before pyruvate, there's a molecule called G3P. So G3P, at the end of glycolysis, G3P gets converted to pyruvate. It's the same size molecule. You just tweak it a little bit and turn it into pyruvate. So G3P can get turned into a lot of different molecules. So in the book, photosynthesis, you know, at the very end of it all, we end up with a bunch of G3P. But you could think in your head, well, the, I mean, really we're going to end up with also glucose because the plant is going to turn that into glucose. Then if the plant doesn't need that, that glucose or whatever sugar it's making, it can store it as starch. Right, so this is the, whatever, the formula for it. It's the opposite of um, of respiration. So with respiration, we're breaking up sugar, and of course we need oxygen for that. And then we're, um, we're making ATP, and then the byproducts are water and carbon dioxide. So here we're doing the opposite. The, 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 the things that are going to go into it are carbon dioxide from the air and then water from around the plant. That's what's needed for photosynthesis. And then the product, what's the output is sugar and oxygen. So it, it, you might see it written different um, with like 6, H, uh, 6 CO2 and whatever, and then you get one C6, H12O6. I just, again, I simplified it. I just put C, H2O. So instead of putting like six here and six here and then one C6H12, I just so I just kind of left it like that. Because I want it to all balance again like the other side. <clears throat> right, so you can see like CH2O and then there's O2 left over. Right? So you're really just taking these atoms and you're switching them all around. Right, you're taking these are the two ingredients, you're putting them together, you're switching around 
um, hydrogens and oxygens, and then this is your new product, right? So, and then of course, you know, doing that, that gives us a waste product of, of oxygen, which we can use, and then our waste product is CO2, which the plants can use, and there you go, you got a circle of life type of deal. So let's get into the PowerPoint portion of it. Hope this works. Hoping on the recording, we've got a PowerPoint presentation right now. Let's see. Uh, can't mess with it. Oh, all right. Okay. I know I stopped presenting. Try again. I'm going to try a different way. Y'all looking at my um, at the PowerPoint? I hope so. Yes. So sunlight. Um, that's where it all starts, right? So plants, plants have the unique ability to act as solar panels and and, and capture sunlight. So we call this sunlight. We call that energy. So there's energy in sunlight. Where is that energy? It it's usually lost as heat. I mean, things get heated up, and then that's heat is energy. So sunlight hits something, that object gets hot, and then you feel the heat. That's the energy. And sometimes you can like actually you can kind of see it like when you're looking at a on a really hot day and you're looking at a street really far ahead you can see like wavy lines. Um, that's that's kind of what's going on. You're seeing you're seeing the energy, right? But plants are different. Plants can take that energy that, that we can't take, and they can they can harness it. So. That's kind of the secret that's in plants. So we call this energy that's in sunlight, we call it photons. P-H-O-T-O-N. So those are those photons are, you know, that's the energy that's in the, the sunlight. And so we call things that can make their own energy, like plants, autotroph. So see at the, at the top that word photo, autotroph? Photo meaning, you know, something about sunlight. Auto meaning self. So whenever you see the word auto in something, it means self. Um, troph, I don't know what it means. Make your own food. The word troph is used in other words too. I just never nailed down the definition. So there's, there's autotrophs and then there's heterotroph. Hetero meaning different. Autotroph makes its own energy, so that's plants, and there's some bacteria that can do it too. They're called um, cyanobacteria, uh, photosynthetic bacteria. <clears throat> so there's some bacteria that can do it, um, yeah, like seaweed, things like that, and, and, and plants. Everything else that you know we have to consume our food, we're called heterotrophs. So you know we're heterotrophs, obviously, and, and um, other animals and things like fungus, you know, they're heterotrophs. So that's all that means. <clears throat> so this is where it happens. It happens in the leaf. But within the leaf, leaves have certain types of cells called mesophyll cells. And you can see there's a mesophyll cell right right here. This is a type of mesophyll cell and 
it's very it's, it's under a very simple um, it's under a microscope it's under a very simple magnification but even under a small magnification you can see all the chloroplast in it so that's one of the organelles it's not in animals, but it's in plant cells. All right, so the chloroplast is where photosynthesis happens. So the chloroplast is the organelle that's in the mesophyll cell. The mesophyll cells have tons of chloroplast, and that's what you're seeing here, all these green dots. All right, so then we're gonna go a little bit further within the chloroplast. You know, what is it about the chloroplast? There's two parts to the chloroplast. One is called thylakoid. So that's these, these discs, these green discs. We call them thylakoid. So there's a thylakoid, or they call it like a thylakoid membrane. And then there's the liquid that these thylakoids are floating in. That liquid's called stroma. So that's that other word right here. So you've got thylakoid and you got stroma. The word grana just means like that's a stack of thylakoids. So you can, and you don't have to worry about that so much. So you've got thylakoid, you've got stroma. Stroma's the liquid. It's kind of around it. The thylakoid are those green discs. So there's this word stroma, but like look at the leaves. And then you'll see this word called, up here they're calling it um, stomata. Yeah, it's right here. And if you take one leaf, like one leaf pore, a stomata, stomata are leaf pores. They're like, they're like uh, parts of the leaf. They, uh, it's like, well, it's not how it works. So they, they, they open up and they let out oxygen and they let in carbon dioxide. So it's, that's how the leaves breathe, I guess. So one of them is called a stoma. So you've got like these two words that are very similar. Stoma, which is like an opening. We can use that word for like in a hospital setting. A stoma is like an opening in the, in the trachea. You got like a breathing tube there. So we call that a stoma, all right? So stoma is an opening on the leaves. And then you have the word stroma with an R. So just don't confuse those if you see those two different words. Stroma is the liquid that the thylakoids are in, right? So within the chloroplast, we have thylakoid and we have stroma. And there you go. So let's talk about what plants do. So this is a um, this is looking at some of the photons that come down, and they come down in all these uh, waves, right? So as you can see, like up on top, it says like gamma rays, X rays, UV light, etc. Right? But a little band of that is coming down as visible light. And so they're just telling you how big they are. I mean, you can see that like radio waves are sometimes huge, like these waves that that are going through the the air. They're sometimes size of sizes of small buildings, right? And, and sometimes they're as long as your arms can go apart. That would be like radio waves, right? And then. Um, you know, then it gets really small because then they're talking about like nanometers, which are like, I don't know, like a millionth of a meter. It doesn't really matter. They're, they're really small, right? So let's just look at this at the visible light, right? So this visible light, when this hits you, you have two, when it hits an object, there's two options that can happen. One option is that this light can just bounce off of it. And when it bounces off, then you see the color. But the other option is that it can be reflected. I said that's the first option, isn't it? It can be reflected, the other option is absorbed. So an, an object can absorb light or it can reflect light. 
light is energy. So it can absorb energy or it can reflect energy. And what's being reflected is usually what you're seeing. So if you're looking at a plant and it's green, that's because it's reflecting green. It's not using that particular wavelength of light, but it is using other ones. So if we look at the most common one that we know about, which is chlorophyll, um, chlorophyll really likes to absorb this red area down here. Can you guys see this? I can't really follow along with where you're pointing at and stuff like that, but I'm using the... Oh, it's not, uh, um, like the pointer's not... Oh, because you're following... Yeah, right. I'm following the slide deck, but the pointer's okay. not really interacting. Look around, if you look around 700, around that number, so the red area, mm. that's chlorophyll. Chlorophyll likes that red. Chlorophyll likes that red. It kind of likes the orange and it kind of likes the yellow. But then when you see the green over around 550, 500, it starts reflecting that. And so that's why plants appear green. And chlorophyll is one type of pigment that's in a plant. There's actually, you know, some plants have lots of pigments in it. Um, <clears throat> but chlorophyll usually, usually dominates. But there's other um, pigments like, for example, one's called a carotenoid. So carotenoid, you think of carrots, right? So that's already going to tell you kind of the colors that get reflected. So carotenoids are reflecting orange, red, yellow, you know, the same wavelengths of light that chlorophyll likes to take in, absorb. Carotenoids don't like it. So carotenoids absorb colors like green, blue, so, you know, towards the, the lower numbers of visible light, like towards the left. That's what carotenoids absorb. Carotenoids reflect reds, oranges, yellows, right? So, you know, if you think about any type of vegetable that you see that is, that's got like a reddish color to it, or an orangish or yellowish color, that's, that's, they're using a different pigment. And then there's other pigments called phycocyanin. So cyanin is, cyan is like a blue. So, you know, they're, they're reflecting purple, blue, you know, all right at the lower end there, like the 380 to 500, they're reflecting that. So they're, they're purplish, they're bluish. Um, and then they're absorbing everything else. So you could find in some plants all of these pigments, and and that's that's true with <clears throat> with a lot of trees. So um, that's that's why trees change color. You know, trees. I mean, not just trees, but like a lot of plants, they work on this idea of a photo period, right? What they're doing is they're measuring the amount of daylight there is. Right. And so people, a lot of people think, well, the leaves are going to change because of um, the weather, you know, once it starts getting colder. And, you know, that might, there might be something to that, but really what the leaves are doing is, they're, is that they're, they're measuring the amount of daylight. Because if, it, if the days are going to be short, and it's going to be like, you know, think about a plant. Just because it's, it's like right now, today, it kind of sucks outside. So it's not, they're just like solar panels, right? It's, they're not, it's not a good day for plants. You know, they're wasting their time right now. And if you think of like right in the morning, they're wasting their time. And late afternoon, when the sun's starting to, to set, if it's like, you know, like in the winter time, that'll be like 4 o'clock, 4.30. They're wasting their time. Their peak time is when that sun's like right up there in the sky, right? so they're measuring the time of the day and they know that when as winter starts to approach days are going to get shorter and they're sticking a lot of energy into creating these leaves and they're not getting a lot of payback because the sun's not out there as many hours so as far as the plant's concerned they're going to kill off the leaves and just ride out the winter and start again like in april or may or something all depends on where you are. 
I mean, obviously, the further you go north, the the um, the shorter the day is in the winter, and then you're going to see <clears throat> more of this dramatic, um, you know, the plant just killing off its leaves. So around October, November, whenever the the plants start to get ready to kill off their leaves, they don't they don't want to feed them. They don't want to supply the leaves anymore. So first thing they do is they shut off the chlorophyll. So for about two weeks, they shut down chlorophyll production. That's the first step. When they shut down chlorophyll, now you can see, now you can see the carotenoids. They've been there, but the chlorophyll's been dominating. So then because of that, you see the, the leaves change color. Not producing chlorophyll. Then after a couple of weeks, you know, everything looks really nice. Then the leaves just get brown, dead, and they fall off. That's it. If you live in the north, it's like really nice weather and it's really beautiful. And they're like, you know, it's like nature saying, hey, you know, I just want to give you like this last party before everything sucks for six months. It's just going to be snow and cold and misery. That's when you come down to Louisiana. Um, so that's it. That's you know that's all about like light and um, so when plants. Let's talk about what happens when plants re um, absorb the light. So that's kind of what I was getting at. Let me skip through that one. So I'm on the one now with the, that's figure 1010, excitation of isolated chlorophyll, blah, blah, blah. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at this. So what happens to a chlorophyll molecule or, or some molecule that absorbs light? So now I want you to think back to, um, I want you to think back to your hydrogen atom going all the way back to like the first day of class. And you imagine like a, a hydrogen atom being like a planet with a moon going around it, right? And the moon going orbiting around it is the electron. So you imagine all these atoms inside chlorophyll and the electrons are going around it, circling around it, orbiting around it like a moon orbits around a planet. Right? And so what happens is that the sunlight hits those atoms and the, and the electrons orbiting around it, and those, those atoms get all excited. They start like vibrating and shaking, and they're getting all worked up. <clears throat> you know, it's like, it's like they're on speed now. And, and so the electrons are going around really fast, and they're kind of like wobbling in their orbit and really unstable because they're getting hit with a lot of energy from the sun. The, the photons from the sun are hitting them. And so what happens to an object is that usually the electron will jump out of its orbit. So it's going around, it's circling the atom, then it jumps out of its orbit, but normally what happens is that the electron goes right back into the orbit again. So it's getting all excited, kind of like wobbling in its orbit, then it jumps out of the orbit and returns right back again. And then what happens is heat is given off. That's what happens to like your car or the street or like other objects. That's why heat is coming off of something. What's happening is that the electrons are jumping out of their orbit and then immediately return. It's just like a thousandth of a second. They jump out and they immediately return. And then heat is given off of that object. That's it, that's why things get off. But plants, you'll notice if you go and touch the leaves of plants, they're not hot because that's like their secret. They figured out how to catch that electron. As soon as that electron jumps out of its orbit, the plants grab the electron. They figured out how to do it. So that's like the difference between things that are autotrophs and everything else, all other objects, right? So um, 
So the photons come down. So if we kind of look at this picture, the photons are coming down from the sun. So here's like the sun on the left. Photons are coming down. They're striking the hydrogen atoms in this chlorophyll. And instead of the atom, instead of the electron circling around, like in the orbit, it gets all excited and it jumps out. Usually it comes right back, but it jumps out. And when it jumps out, the plant catches it. And now we have a source of energy. So you just, it, it, it grabs the electrons from every chlorophyll molecule and it just starts collecting them. So now you've got electrons. And electrons, that's electricity, that's energy. I mean, we, we do the same thing with, with electrons. We, we harness electrons, right? But we do it, animals, we do it in the Krebs cycle. We break stuff up. We break up that acetyl-CoA or whatever that molecule is. We break it up and we harvest all the electrons. Plants don't have to go through that. They grab it from sunlight. So then you might think like, if you imagine you're like a plant and the electrons are jumping out and the plant's grabbing the electrons. Okay, well, what, what's happening to the atoms now? They lost their electrons. You can't just keep doing that forever, right? You're gonna run out of electrons. The plant is gonna run out of electrons if you keep pulling the electrons. So where does the plant get more electrons? From water? So you get it from water. So that's, that's exactly where it gets it. So as long as you have water, plants can, t can keep Plants will split water. So if you think about what water is, it's H2O. So that means H2, two hydrogens, one oxygen. So it takes the water and it breaks it apart. It takes the oxygen off the water. We don't need that. Throw that out. Throw that into the air. Now we've got the hydrogens. So we can take the electrons off the hydrogens. So now we've got a supply. We have a permanent supply of electrons. As long as the plant has water, the plant will have a supply of electrons. And electrons are energy. So I mean, I guess you could look at it this way. The plant is taking electrons from water. We're taking electrons from organic material, whatever we eat, from bread or something, right? And we have to go through this process where we glycolysis, prep cycle, we're breaking it down. And then what do we do with those electrons? We take those electrons and we make, we, we put it through the electron transport chain, right? And then we use that to make ATP. That's what we do with electrons. We get the electrons from food and we use it to make ATP. Plants are gonna do the same thing. Just where do they get their electrons? It's different. But when they get electrons, when they start storing up electrons, they're also going to make ATP with it. A very similar pathway, by the way. They use an electron transport chain, just like we do. The only difference is with us, we take all of our electrons and we convert it all over into ATP. Plants, they're going to do both. They're going to make ATP. They're going to hold on to some electrons. This right here in front of you is, so there's two types of reactions that happen with the plant. When the sun's out, those are called light reactions, right? So when the sun's out, they're light reactions, and we're going to use that to start collecting energy. We want to collect electrons, and then we also want to make some ATP. So we're going to take the electrons, make ATP with it, and then we're going to hold on to some electrons too. So actually you have like two sources of energy. You know, it's like a hybrid car. You've got a gas engine, but you've got a battery as well. So that's kind of like plants. They've got two types of energy that they use. So um, that's the light reactions. And then you have dark reactions, which 
you take all that ATP and electrons and you're going to make sugar out of it. You don't need the sun to do that. It could be nighttime. It doesn't matter. So they call these light reactions dark reactions. Or your, some books will say light dependent and light independent reactions. That's actually a little more accurate because, you know, um, to get electrons and ATP, we need light because we need the photons. You're converting photons from the sun, you're converting that energy, you're, con you're transferring it or converting it into ATP and electrons. And so that's what this slide in front of you is showing. It's showing the light reactions. So the light reactions happen in the thylakoid. The dark reactions are going to happen in the stroma, that liquid stuff that the thylakoid's floating in. So the light reactions have, and I'm going to probably go back to this. Let me show you this one. So that is kind of like an easier version. I'm on the one with like the construction workers. That's an easier version of this here. So if we go to the photo with like the construction workers, you see that there's two within the thylakoid, within the light reactions, you have two photosystems. So they're calling it photosystem two, photosystem one, which is backwards. And there's no special reason for that. They discovered photosystem one first, then they discovered photosystem two some years after. And, you know, they don't give a shit about students, so they just kept the names. So, photosystem two is coming first. So, if you look at the electron, if we follow like these pictures, here's the electron. The photon that's that dude with the hammer, he's bouncing the electron out of its orbit. So that electron's circling around the hydrogen. It gets knocked out of its orbit. And then up at the top, she catches it. Normally that electron falls right back down, but not in plants. She catches it. And then look what she's doing with it. She's sending it down that mill. It's that same idea that, it, that we had with respiration. It's the electron, that mill that she's sending it down, that's the electron transport chain. So it's making ATP. You know, it's like turning on those pumps and it's making all those, those protons go to one side, same thing. And so look, if you follow the electrons, they end up in photosystem one. And so then, again, the sunlight is hitting photosystem one. It gets knocked up. This guy, Harry Back, he's catching it. That's why he doesn't wear a tank top. Don't talk to him about it. And he catches it, and now he's just dropping it in the bucket. And notice underneath that bucket, NAD. It's NADPH, but... Remember what I was saying, like NAD or FAD, those are electron carriers. Right? So he drops it in the bucket, which is an electron carrier. So now if you look at this, we have two different types of energy here. We got electrons, and then we have ATP. So if you look at both of these photosystems, photosystem two is making ATP. Photosystem one is just holding on to the electrons. So we have two types of energy here, ATP and electrons. And that is kind of like going back to this. <clears throat> so it's the same thing. You see photosystem two, and then it goes down the cytochrome complex, which if you see right up, forget about cytochrome complex. I mean, don't worry about it. But you see right above it, it says electron transport chain. So they're catching the electrons, sending them down the electron transport chain. That's making ATP. And then those electrons are dropping into photosystem one. 
Now the sunlight is also hitting photosystem one. So the electrons are jumping out again. You can skip this part here. Just know that the electrons are being held on to. We'll hold, photosystem one is gonna hold on to the electrons. Notice the names here. If you look at photosystem two, it says P680. If you look at photosystem one, it means P700. Um, it'd be nice if you knew if you knew those other terms. I mean, that's the, really the more accurate terms. P680, or you know, photosystem 680 and P700, and all that means is I. That's the wavelength of light that it likes the most. They're both red. They're like both red wavelengths of light, and they're both like right next to each other. But that's it. You know, P680 and P700. They're talking about a wavelength of light. It doesn't really matter too much for us, but just know the words P680 and P700. So again, this is all happening in the thylakoid. So this is all light reaction, light dependent. And it all happens in the thylakoid. So at the end of the light reactions, we end up with a supply of ATP, and a supply of electrons. So now we got our energy. Now we got to take all that energy and we got to do something with it. So, any questions so far? Oh, wow. She took a long time with this. All right, we're almost done. So, we got the energy now. This whole thing that I've been lecturing about so far is the story of how we take photon energy from the sun and convert that to ATP and electrons, which we say chemical energy. So we're taking the energy from the sun and we're converting it to chemical energy, AKA ATP and electrons. Now, the next part of it is the dark reactions. The dark reactions is the story of how we take the chemical energy, ATP and electrons, and we convert that into sugar, because that's the ultimate goal of the plant. We want to, the plant wants to make sugar, because it's got shit it's got to do. It's got to grow and live like a plant lives, and then it's got to store some energy for the winter time, Potato plant's gotta make its potato, so we have french fries. That, that's all what's happening right now. So there's two conversions. The first conversion is converting sunlight to ATP and electrons. The second conversion, ATP and electrons, convert that to french fries. What, what, yeah. what, what slot are you on? Oh, now I'm on 10, 17 in Calvin cycle. Okay, thank you. It says layer three. So you see on this slide, there are a bunch of circles. Well, first of all, it's going around. This looks like the Krebs cycle. It's, it's going around like a clock. Like an old school clock. Well, like, I guess like the setting you could put on your Apple Watch that a lot of you don't know actually how it works, but it looks kind of cool. It's like that. So it's going around, and then we got like these little circles, like these gray circles to represent, that, that represents carbons. So if you, <clears throat> um, if you look at the, like the top where it says CO2, it says input in CO2, it's got one little circle, that means one carbon. Because remember, that's how we measure the size of molecules. Like how big are these molecules? Look at the very bottom where it says output. G3P, it's got three dots. That means it's three carbons long. Because that's, that's, that's how we're measuring the size of molecules. <clears throat> so this thing's going around and around and with the Krebs cycle, we were dropping acetyl-CoA into it and it was getting shredded up. 
this is different. This is not breaking things up. This is actually building things. So as it goes around, look at that molecule to the left on the left side over at like the 10 o'clock position. It's called RUBP, ribulose biphosphate. What it's doing as it's coming around, we're at 10 o'clock now, and look how many carbons it is, five. It's coming around, it's picking up a carbon dioxide from the air. So this, this clock, whatever, is going around. And, and, and how are we powering this thing to go around? Well, we're using ATP and electrons. That's, that's powering this cycle to go around and around. So it's coming around. This RUVP is coming around. It's five carbons long. It comes around and it picks up this carbon dioxide. So five plus one, six. Now it's six carbons long, right here at 1230. 1230 spot, it's six carbons long. Okay, that's like, it's six carbons long and they're not showing it on here, but that's what it is. And it's, it's, too, it's, it's too unstable, like the plant can't handle it. So it just breaks in half. It's six carbons long, but it actually just breaks in half. And so you end up with two of these three carbon molecules. Don't worry about the name of it. So this happens, I mean, I could, this is where I get in, this is where I kind of like get in trouble. So I'm trying, I, I want to explain what happened. So like the short story, the short version of this story is every time this goes around three times, we have a net gain of three, of, of one, sugar g3p so like if you look at the top you've got three little circle things going in where it says input you've got three carbon dioxides going in so there's three carbons and the output we have one g3p because we have to reuse we have to recycle some of these some of these carbons it's so like you see these circles here it's like well there's three here and then we're at the bottom where it says Glyceraldehyde three phosphate. There's three there, and then if you go to number five, like where I'm at the I'm at that seven thirty eight o'clock position. There's three there, and then how does it all of a sudden become five? And then if we go around to the two o'clock position, why is it back to three again? Right. So this this photo here, this uh, slide is a little confusing. So just look at it this way. The input three carbon dioxides. The output at the bottom here at six o'clock, one G3P, one sugar. And so we can take that G3P and make lots of different things. So when this thing goes around three times, you end up with one G3P. You could say, if this goes around six times, you would end up with a glucose, All right? So it's saying here, if you look at the output at the bottom and it says G3P, and then next to it, it's saying glucose and other organic compounds. I mean, practically what they're saying is a plant can use it to make glucose, a plant can use it to make cellulose, which is the, the wall around their cells. The plant can use it to make starch. So we can have pancakes. So the plant's making a bunch of sugars that it uses. And then, um, so I think that's probably like the main, you know, there's th three different stages to it. I don't necessarily care so much about it. Um, if, if you were to see a test question on like a placement test for nursing, like they do this and I don't know why, or some other test, placement test. Sometimes they will talk about, they'll have photosynthesis questions. And so the key words to know here are RUBP, that's a word that will be on this test. Rubisco, that is a word that will be, that 
you might run into again on a test. Um, and Rubisco is an enzyme. It's the enzyme that connects RUBP with carbon dioxide. So you will see that because it's like the most common enzyme on the planet. Like they say that there's billions of tons of this enzyme. If you were to like take all the enzyme that exists on the planet and put it together, it'd be like billions of tons. <clears throat> so, um, you know, that you might see that on a test. And then just remember that's carbon fixation. You're fixing carbon dioxide to this RUVP. That's the only part that anyone ever asks you about. No one's gonna ask you about phase two reduction, phase three regeneration. If you wanna watch a, a, a video on it that kind of like explains it better, there's a ton of them. You just go to YouTube and put in um, the Calvin cycle or put in dark reactions. So RUB is the enzyme that connects itself to carbon dioxide? Rubisco is the enzyme that connects RUBP and carbon dioxide. Do you see the RUBP, how it's like five carbons long? Yes. And then the carbon dioxide is one carbon. Rubisco sticks those two together. Okay, and then it shows that three carbon molecules, but you have two of those at that point, correct? Yeah, exactly. Because as soon as our, as soon as Rubisco sticks those two together, it can't hold. It can't stay together. It's too unstable. It it breaks in half. And they're not showing that on here, but that's what happens. That's why it goes back to three again. It's actually two of them. And then really all that's happening, because if you look at like the two o'clock position, you notice that it's three carbons, right? And then you look right below it, that's three carbons. If you look right below that, that's three carbons. So what's the difference between three phosphoglycerate and one three by phosphoglycerate? It's just it's the same amount of carbons, so the size is the same. It's just that you're you're playing with the oxygen, the hydrogens. You're 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 changing those around. They're not showing it to you on this, but they're in different spots. Or if you notice, like, and I'm not going to test you on this, but like, look at the three phosphoglycerate, and then underneath it, it says one three by phosphoglycerate. You notice that the three phosphoglycerate has one P on the right side of it, and then the molecule below it has two P's. And all that means is like the, the P from ADP goes and touches it and gives it energy. And what they're not showing you is that, that that's switching around the oxygens and the hydrogens. This stuff is all about what organic chemistry is. You know, organic chemistry will then ask you, okay, well, where is the new oxygen now? You, you change the oxygen from one spot to another spot, where is it now? You know, to me, it's kind of meaningless, but I mean, unless, unless that's really your thing, right? But even if you're gonna be like a, a nurse or something, I mean, do you really need to know that? No. And, and you said after, after three revolutions, you get one G3P. Exactly. So after, Six revolutions, you get two, and then nine would be a glucose. Six would be uh, double the G3P is a glucose. Okay. Yeah, so G3P is like half of a sugar, half of a glucose. I don't mean to use the word sugar. We, we use this word when we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to. You can't take glucose and call it sugar. That's, you know, everything's sugar. Like, you see on the slide it says G3P and then it says underneath a sugar. So, what I really mean to say is it's half of a glucose. Um, notice here, when you look up here, look at this stuff that's in yellow. So there's an eight, there's two ATPs up here, and then when you look over at like three o'clock, there's an NADPH. 
So if you notice, there's two ATPs, but one NADPH. Um, and I'm not, I'm not giving you like the actual numbers, but what I'm trying to tell you is that it's using, this Calvin cycle is using a lot of ATP and not as much, not as many electrons. So we've got two sources of energy that are in this cycle, ATP and electrons. But we're using more ATP than the electrons. So what ends up happening is that after a while, you're going to have um, the elect you're going to have a buildup of electrons and not enough ATP. Right? The balance is going to be because the plants making equal. Like in the light reactions, you have an equal amount of like ATP and electrons, but you're not using them in equal amounts. The Calvin cycle is using more ATP than electrons. So after, after a few times this thing's going around, you're ending up with extra electrons because you're not using them as fast. So now we have a problem. We have to make more ATP without making the electrons. So if you could go back a few slides to, we'll go back to the, the construction worker slide. That'll work. So we need to take this and we need to tweak it a little bit. We don't need to put any electrons in the bucket. We need to just make ATP. So it's pretty easy. What happens is that that guy, Harry back, instead of putting the electrons in the bucket, he's just going to take a few times and throw it back down onto the ramp. You know, where she's putting her electrons, he's going to throw the electrons down there also because we need to do, we need to like spend a few minutes making just ATP to, to make the balance back. So the plant will do that sometimes. We call this cyclic electron flow cycle. It's going around. He throws the electron onto the ramp. It rolls down the ramp. And then in photosystem one, you see that electron just gets knocked right back up to him again. He's going to turn around, throw it back down onto the ramp. So it's going in a circle. And why is he doing that? Because he needs more ATP, but he doesn't need any electrons for a few minutes because he's got to try to get it all balanced back. He used to call that cyclic photophosphorylation. Thank God they got rid of that word. So we just call it now cyclic electron flow. So just know that um, cyclic electron flow, you don't need photosystem two. So if you see the photo and how the guy is throwing it back, the guy in photosystem one, he's throwing it back down onto the ram, onto the mill. That doesn't use photosystem two. That just, it's just photosystem one. And it's only to make ATP. It's not about storing electrons. We're just trying to make some more ATP to catch up. I believe that took an hour. You guys have any questions? I do just back on that. The cyclic electron flow you said it does not need photosystem one. It's just the constant, constant making. It only uses photosystem one. It's not using photosystem two. Okay. Or another way I could say this, by the way, I could say that it operates in the absence of P680, because the other name for photosystem two is P680. I'll be honest with you, 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 the stuff that I've taught up to this point, it's all hamburger meat and no hamburger helper, meaning that all that stuff up till today you need it. It will come back. It's important that you understand it. So if you're going into even physical therapy, all that stuff is valuable stuff that you should have in your permanent memory. Photosynthesis, you're not going to practically use it. You know, not, not if you're going into some kind of medical field. You know, this is a lot of hamburger helper and not a whole lot of meat. Not to say hamburger helper doesn't taste good on its own. It does, but... You know, it's not what. So 
you know, if you're going to forget some of this stuff from today's lecture in the future after the test, I wouldn't blame you. But all the stuff before today's lecture, including cell respiration, I advise you to all of you that you are listening to this, put this in your permanent memory. Because these, it's going to help you with all your other classes. Do you have to take micro? Do you have to take AMP 1 and 2? It, 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 you need it. Are you going to take pharmacology in the future? You, you need all of this. Even the stuff on the atoms, very critical that you know it. See, even today we're talking about atoms still. We can't like leave atoms. We're talking about electrons going around hydrogen, it's like, why can't I just let it go? Because that's part of biology. All right, any other questions? So I'm gonna wrap this chapter up. Um, the only thing I was trying to, I didn't even talk about this, but um, it's just saying that, you know how in humans, we had this, you know how all the H pluses were shoved onto one side and then they all came through like one place or two places or whatever I was trying to show you in the other lecture? That happened in the mitochondria. Here it happens in the thylakoid. That was all. So same idea. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. There are these special plants called C4 plants. They work on a little bit different uh, system. Look at that sugar cane. That's not very, they're really short. All right. Okay, so that's it. Um, I'm going to stop the presentation. We stop recording and I think we're done.